Thank you so much. Next, you know, things move fast in the tech world, and no one knows that better than Google's top woman executive, Susan Wojcicki. She took the helm of YouTube earlier this year, and she's here to talk about scaling businesses, changing jobs, and how she gets it all done. And this part just isn't fair. She's expecting her fifth child. <laughs> Please welcome Fortune's award-winning Jennifer Reingold and Susan Wojcicki. Susan. Hello. It's great to be here. Thank you for inviting me. And we're really happy that you were able to uh, make it here today. I know the morning was a little rough with the fifth kid on the way, or yeah. at least as your sister said. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It was great to be introduced by my sister. Thank you, Anne. Thank you. So Susan, you have been CEO of YouTube since February after leaving um, a, the, your post at Google as the you were called the most powerful person in all of advertising. Um, you're in a really much different role now, running a specific business. So tell me a little bit about the transition. Yeah. Um, well, I had worked in advertising for almost 12 years. And so when the opportunity came up to work at YouTube and work with creators and think about the next generation of TV, I was really excited. And um, when I first got to YouTube, it reminded me a lot of Google in 2003 or 2004 when we were a much smaller company, when we had all the different cross-functional groups in the same area, and we had all these big plans, but we didn't have enough people to get them done. And so a lot of times in my head I was thinking like, what did I do in 2003 or 2004 when we didn't have all the people to help us, when we didn't have all these different uh, different people who were experts in the area. How did we get through it? And so I've been thinking a lot about that and thinking about how do we, what did I learn from that? Um, going through it once, how can I do it better the second time? And what have you learned? Um, you mean being there? Well, I mean, I think the first and most important thing is scale. Um, and a lot about scaling is getting the right people in place and figuring out who do you need in place to be able to get it done. Because you learn really quickly, I mean, I'm sure as everyone here in the audience knows that you know, you're only as good as your team is and your job is to really hire the experts and to set them up and give them the right direction and the right resources to make that happen. And so, um, and also to set the right priorities. And so that's also been a big challenge, which is how YouTube I think is similar to Google, which is you know, if there are 50 things you wanna do and you only have enough resources for 10, you don't want to peanut butter your team. You want to make some hard choices and say, these are the things that we're going to do. These are the things we're going to do really, really well. Um, and then do them well and hire the right people. Give them the resources. Give them the funding to make that happen. Now, it's a little bit different, though, because you are part of Google. And it's not exactly a startup with no cash, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, you do have some advantages. Yes, there's some advantages. But in many ways, it's still, it's still has a lot of those components where you only have so many people. So it's, and, is it and the I, spirit of that that you're trying to, to, to capture in a way? Well, I think part of it is also the industry. Because if you look at TV now and you look at video, there's so many changes. And the fact that um, a lot of it's being developed over the top, meaning it's being delivered over IP. Um, YouTube has unleashed all these new creators who, um, I mean, you know, our kids can become creators in their bedroom. Um, and we have a whole industry of people who are creating content in ways they've never done that before. So I think there's a, the change in the industry, but then just the fact that there's just so many things that are happening and YouTube is in so many different places. How do we prioritize and focus a company so we can get the things that are most important to us, get them done? So what is YouTube? I mean, you can think of it as, as a content center. You can think of it as a channel. You can think of it as a competitor to any form of entertainment. How do you define it? How do I define it? Um, well, you know, there are a few use cases that I think are super important to, you, to YouTube. And, and as I've been there, I've come to really appreciate them and realize how meaningful they are to, to the world. Um, 
So I think one of them is that it gives a voice to people who otherwise would not have a voice. And um, so I think you know when you look at a lot of times the communities or you look at places where there's a lot of unrest, Venezuela or Ukraine or any areas where there's political conflict, um, you have people in those areas who are uploading and trying to tell their story and trying to communicate with the rest of the world. And that I think is, that's, that's one thing that is so important and so dear to my heart. Uh, you also see people who otherwise don't have a community. So um, there was, you know, a, a few years back there was a whole issue with teen um, gay lesbian suicide. And so there was a whole, um, there was a whole um, outreach to be able to communicate and there were kids who were uploading saying like it gets better and lots of people were able to do that and so you sort of think like if you didn't have a way to reach kids if you didn't have a way for people to communicate across the globe something that's really important you know what what else would happen and so you realize like YouTube really plays an unusual way that anybody can communicate and um, I mean recently we just had the ALS ice bucket challenge where people all over participated you know, and dumped ice on themselves and videotaped themselves doing it. So I think the fact that it brings together a global community around video and shares their stories um, about being human, about what's important to them is really, really, mm -hmm. is really important. And that is sort of a social mission, but then of course you are a business and you're competing against the Disneys of the world and the Netflixes of the world. Talk a little bit about the content part of this. I, I've been hearing a lot of rumors that, that there may be more um, resources put into content. Maybe yeah. you want to talk about that? Yeah. Uh, so well, when I came to YouTube, I, um, you know, I had watched YouTube. I think people of our, I'll say probably mostly of our generation, a lot of times we look something up specific on YouTube. Like we, someone tells us about something or we see a link on, an, on a page. I think if you look at the younger generation and you ask them, in fact, I was shocked because after I got the job at YouTube, I went and spoke to my son and it turned out he had a hundred different channels that he followed and I had no idea um, that he was following those hundred channels. And so, and he knew everything about those hundred creators. And so if you look at the next generation and you see how they're consuming media, you realize how influential this is. So Variety just did this study of the top of the top stars for teens, and half of them were were on YouTube stars. Most and of whom we've probably never heard of, right? Which is another part of the strategy. Well, so most of them probably, like, we may not have heard of. Um, <laughs> but your kids are watching it right now. But your kids are watching it right Instead now. Instead of the live stream of this. all of your kids. <laughs> and so this is really, really important. And so, and I realized that this medium, when I first looked at it, was, it was a little bit harder for me to understand. But the more I watched it, the more I realized, like, this is just a different medium. And even though it's video, um, it's, it's like you would think, oh, well, online, TV, it should be the same, but it's not. And the reason it's not is because it doesn't just have to be the 22 minutes that TV is. Um, it can be any, any length. It could be you know, one minute or an hour. Um, so there's a lot more creative freedom. Um, also, like all the creators have unlimited creator freedom because creator freedom, they're usually creating for themselves. They own this entity themselves. So they're very authentic and they say what they feel. Um, and so the next generation really expects the content to be authentic and they communicate with each other. So the, so the, the fans will comment, um, the creators will say things like, well, what do, what do you think my next show should be about? And people will write in and, and put the comments and then the creator will say, well, based on so-and-so's comment, I've decided that my next episode will be about you know, whatever that was and post the comment that came from that. And so there's this interactivity that's happening that just doesn't happen with traditional media and so I really feel like it's a different type of medium. And so one of the things that I've been trying to do is try to figure out, well, how do we grow this even more? How do we make this ecosystem even more successful? And so like recently we've um, we started to do a lot of promotional campaigns. Um, I saw in the subway in New York City, and I went and looked up each of those women, by the okay. way, none yeah. of whom I'd ever heard of. Had you heard of them before? Nope. But see, now you have. And now one of them is on Dancing with the Stars, I yes, think, yes. Stephanie Moda. Yes. Um, and so I think a lot, so we've been doing a lot more promotion because we realized that these YouTube personalities were just, were, 
really well known to their audiences, but not known to other people. And so we're doing a lot more promotion. Um, we're actually starting to take some of our creators and s because a lot of times they're saying, well, we don't really have the budget to do our next show, but we have this really amazing idea. How do I fund it? Um, so we've been working on enabling them to be funding, doing some funding for them. Um, so you're they actually can helping even to more. Can you apply for this? How does one how does one get the funding for this? Yeah, they can they can apply for it, and then we work with them, okay. um, and we you know so we're really mostly working with with creators who are on YouTube who have already um, have you know they've proven themselves in some way because they have an audience or they have a group. Well, we're thinking about like so helping, you're sort of help helping them do people even that, more. Are, that have already achieved a certain level on their own. You're giving mm -hmm. so there's a it, you, there's a name for this, right? YouTube Originals. Right. Uh, so we've been working with them of like well. You know, how to, because you know some of these some of these creators, um, I mean Bethany, you mentioned Bethany Moda. I mean she started when she was, I think she was 13, wow. and she was being bullied, and so she's decided she was going to do her own show. She filmed it out of her bedroom. She still sometimes films out of her bedroom, and you know my my kids talk about Bethany Moda. Bethany Moda did this, therefore I need to do you know this too. Um, <laughs> and so. Um, yeah, and so she was just on Dancing with the Stars. She's been, you know, she's actually pretty well known across the board right now. So I'd, I'd love to have a little bit of time for questions. Um, do we have any? And if we don't, I will quickly say. Um, oh, we do. Okay. Yes, in the back. Hi, um, I'm Julia from uh, Inner Trend Imprint. From a content standpoint, in terms of censorship, how does that work? Um, does YouTube have? your own set of censorship regulation, yeah. or is it more self-regulation? Yeah, um, well, so YouTube has its own sets of policies, and so there'll be some sets of things that we decide from a community standpoint don't make sense for us as a community. And, and you know, so one example would be if something um, is really violent or inciting violence, um, we would pull that down, or um, you know, if something is mature content, um, more adult that we don't think is appropriate. So there are a set of things that we decide are not appropriate for the community, um, but but we would never pull something down um, because we're like we don't like the creative or the artistic direction. Um, so our creators are creators; they're free to post whatever they want. We get 400 hours um, posted. Um, 400 hours posted every minute to YouTube. And so we're getting yeah. tons and tons of that content. That's unbelievable. Yeah. That is an incredible statistic. Yeah. Um, we've got time for another question. Yes. Mike's coming to you. Um, so, th I'm Mary, I'm Vanna Karam from the Media Company. So, I'm fascinated by the fact that somebody like PewDiePie has 30 million subscribers, right? Mm -hmm. And so, when you look at the YouTube stars that many of us don't know and they're following, do you, t do you um, sort of do an analysis to understand what's behind their success, right? A Swedish guy who's watching video games taping himself, like, what's behind that trend? <laughs> You know, I mean, on, honestly, I'm looking for the insight, right? Because you're inside watching that. And, you know, when I tell other people that more people watch people watching video games in the World Series, these are like statistics that's hard for me to understand. Yeah. So I'm interested in sort of the insight that you guys have as somebody within that world. Like, what's driving that? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so you know, actually, so I'll just say I have, as we, I have four kids, and my kids have actually really helped me understand this. Um, and so the way I would, I would describe it is, you know, a lot of kids like video games probably. You know, some of you may or may not have played video games. And so when you think about it and you're playing it with a friend, um, there is some kind of bonding experience because, like, a lot of times you can see that your friend or someone who's an expert, they can play it in a way that you could not have played it. And so there's a lot of interest in seeing how is someone else playing this game. Maybe they have tricks, maybe they've gotten to levels that they haven't. And just like you would play it with a friend, your friend might say really funny things um, at, as they're playing the game. And so, so uh, the kids actually, and I've experienced this with my own kids, where they just love this stuff. Um, you can't get them to, to not want to watch it. And I think probably the best way so of explaining it is... You're talking about people, people watching other people doing something. Playing a, playing a video game. Okay, just and, clearing. Yeah, other people watching playing a video game. And I guess I would ex explain it as this is an eSport. Um, we watch people play football and basketball and hockey. 
Um, and you know, we like that. Like, doesn't mean we have to play it ourselves, but yet they're able to accomplish things that we're not able to accomplish. And so if you're playing a video game and you've always never could get past level two and then you see someone who's on level eight, it's actually really interesting to you. And a lot of these people have personalities like where they're really funny, they talk about the game. Um, and so, you know, there's a community component of it, people commenting. And so, yeah, I think this is one of the things that um, probably I personally wouldn't have anticipated the platform being used for, but has become a really, really successful and popular way, and I think we're going to see a lot more of it. Great. Susan, we are out of time, but I hope that you will all use the word eSport when you refer to YouTube. <laughs> thank you so much. Okay, great. Thank you.